Welcome to the Nerd Culture's Dead Podcast. I'm your host and thoroughly a nerd, Zach. Today's topic is going to be collectability versus affordability in the nerd culture. So, Jen, can you go ahead and introduce yourself and why you're here? Hi, I'm Jen. I'm from <laughs> Nerd Culture is Dead. I'm here because I live here and this is my channel too. Um, I collect shit. I know nerd shit. Go me. All right, awesome. And Bill is our guest this evening. Uh, hi, I'm Bill. I am a lifelong nerd and a lifelong collector. Uh, I have pretty much since uh, I've been a young kid till now been buying toys and continue to do so. Um, toys and all kinds of things. Weapons, cards, you name it. We buy it. I get it. Yeah. Lots of stuff. Alrighty. So, collectively, that means we spend way too much money on shit we really don't need, mm. which inherently isn't a problem. The issue is then later on, some things end up being worth more than others, some things end up being a prospective buy that can retain value, and some things just end up flopping. And so, collectability versus affordability. The idea that initially, we all may be able to be priced in and be able to buy something at a reasonable price. Think comic books back in the golden age, the 70s, 80s comics runs, right? Before we started actually mass printing everything. True. Sure. We can all buy into these things at fucking 25 cents an issue. Now, these books are worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, so. And now no one can buy them. <laughs> Except if you go online and read the PDF. Because they've all been scanned. It's fine. You can all read. But nowadays, companies have seen this and went ahead and decided that it's perfectly fine to, instead of charging a normal price for a comic book today, being like... Two to four dollars an issue, which is still insane. We know. I thought comics went for like twenty bucks a piece, give or take. That's if you buy like a large collection mm -hmm. or like the volumes or compendiums, where mm -hmm. it's lots of mass issues combined into a single book. Gotcha. I think where nerd culture comes into play here is, in my experience, comic book shops used to be the place in town, the one place in town. We, we had one that I remember, Mike's mm -hmm. Comic Cut up in Queens, New York was the one place in town you can go to get back issues. Because at that point, I was buying comic books uh, on the newsstand, at the newsstand, on a, mm -hmm. a circular rack at the newsstand at the uh, corner store. Mike's Comic Cut, when I discovered it was a place to buy back, you can get back issues? Wow. Uh, so we'd go down there and we'd fill in the holes and fill in the gaps of things that we didn't have or things that we wanted to read and turn on to different stuff. There really wasn't a whole big scene or genre around it as of yet. It was a place to get back issues. I've even ordered back issues out of the comics. You know, you subscribe to them, you can order, oh, okay, mm -hmm. you can get Batman. And I would, I would, I would, I would do that. I remember the first time I had seen a comic book convention and it kind of gave me the feeling that something was going on. Mm -hmm. But you know, a comic book convention, what's this? It was uh, at a Ramada Inn. It was a salon at a Ramada Inn in Queens. Uh, we happened to be staying there uh, because of uh, we had a, a household accident. We were staying for a couple nights in a hotel. And we come down through the lobby, and there's this little computer sign you know, with the little dot on, dots on the side that you have to peel off. Ah. It says, Comic Book Convention. And it was like eight dealer tables, a guy showing Godzilla on a 16 millimeter, you know, film. Like, you know, oh, this is awesome. And again, it was a place where I could get back issues. Mm -hmm. I remember specifically being able to get G.I. Joe number 26 and 27, the origin of Snake Eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, so I knew at that point something was starting to happen. Uh, but by then, a lot of the things that I had bought and, and played with were gone. So I was replacing it with this other thing now. Oh, yeah, and we'll go ahead and start talking about a little more where this collectability versus affordability issue mm -hmm. comes in. So yeah. we'll go ahead and bring up a classic example here, Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. Right. They went ahead and decided that because these people initially bought into Magic spending thousands and thousands of dollars on sealed product back when it was you know still at retail value, the cards had then begin to intrinsically hold value because there was money at stake with the game. You could go into tournaments and win money. So therefore, the cards that were winning retained value better than cards that were not. And they decided to come up with a system called the Reserve List. Cards from 1993 until, I think it was 1995, a specific list of cards. These include, you know, Black Lotus, the Mocks, and the original dual lands, cards that will never be printed again are added to this list. And now, 25 years later, 
some of these cards are worth ridiculous money. Where original dual lands, which just tap for a plains or a mountain, right, or a island or a swamp, two land types run for thousands of dollars for near basic lands. Or in extreme cases where an auction, a Black Lotus, about a few years ago in 2019, sold for $511,100. Man, I wish I had that. Uh, Just ever. It's such a... To hear that number is, is wonderful in a collector's sense. But to me, it's like one of my... Unfortunately, one of my bigger follies in, in this in this realm. I, I managed a comic book shop in 93, 94... And did not buy Magic the Gathering from previews because, you know, we had lost so much money on Milk Pogs. And, you know, Fleer Ultra X-Men and Skybox DC and things like that sold only well enough till, till the chase cards sold out. And then that was it. Wizards of the Coast was bringing something different around. And I didn't understand it and refused to buy in. I was like, nope, we're going to have mm-hmm. 20,000 boxes of that stuff just sitting around. Boy, $511,000. <laughs> I wish I had bought a few boxes. You know, I wish I had given it a shot. Well, and some of it, too, it's like, because the average person isn't going to have that. The average person, at most, will probably have maybe a $100 card, if that. Like, that. that's that's cap. Like, I personally won't buy a Magic card, for the most part, in general. But, like, I refuse to spend more than $20 on on this. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, mm-hmm. I can't. It's I, I can print this on a piece of paper in my computer like yeah, versus me who sees the intrinsic value in this and is more on the collectability side i don't mind spending 200 dollars on a see, magic card because i know it's going to stay at 200 dollars for a while if see, not become more expensive and that's the difference so for me when i collect something it's like my shot glasses for instance i collect shot glasses and it's I'll use them, but it's it's a nice little collection and hey a shot glass is what 10 bucks at most like it's a reasonably priced mm-hmm. thing to collect, and it's well, not I, its not going to, like, overwhelm me, and it's not going to bankrupt me. I tell you what, that Animal Kingdom shot glass I bought you for $30? Okay, well, that's an well, Animal Kingdom Disney shot glass. Yeah, yeah that, that's... Oh, was, no, 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 I'm sorry. That is, that is a uh, toothpick holder. Yeah, sorry, toothpick holder. <laughs> I asked for a shot glass at Disney, and they were like, oh, we don't have shot glass, we have toothpick holders, and I was like... It's a shot they glass. They were real upset when <laughs> like we insisted they... on shot glass. I, I don't have, know if, I, like, I, by I have, contract, you'll have to say I have that. A, I have God. a South of the Border, South Carolina's shot glass and salt and pepper shaker set with the big sombrero and the cactus and mm-hmm. cheesy as shit. But I think you say you would spend 200 You say you wouldn't spend more than 20 When you say you'd spend 200 are you using that to enhance your deck? Or are you buying it for intrinsic value alone? Uh, it ends up partially becoming a way of both. So, mm-hmm. for example, right. I'll go ahead and pull out a card here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Taigam Ojitai Master. This was a speculative buy. I bought it for 60 cents when I figured out that dragons were going to be reprinted with the Dungeons & Dragons set that was coming out. I had heard that, yeah. I knew Tiamat was going to be a card. I go, oh shit, people are going to want to build dragons. I'll buy this for 65 cents back when nobody wanted to build dragons. And then now that's a $7 card. Okay. It spiked at $25. I could have sold it. I didn't because I wasn't hanging out into the market at the time. And I thought, you know what? I might build dragons. So inherently, yeah, I will buy cards because I want them to power up my decks or I need specific pieces because they all do different things. Or I'll buy it as a speculative buy to try and make money off of it because you can easily do so. Sure. I find I do kind of the same things you both do. For the most part. Whatever I'm buying, if I'm buying figures or cards or something, I will always think I'm not going to go above X amount of dollars. Mm-hmm. Generally, on an action figure, I try not to go above 40. On replicas, weapons, things <laughs> like this, try not to go above a couple hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there are times, and I and I just did it this weekend, I, I, I'll drop, I dropped 80 bucks on an action figure because... Uh, you know, reasons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they come out with it in an archive series, in, in, in a different series or on a different card, and then I go, well, but the more desirable one would be the, and if I bite the bullet now, what I also, what, what, what I try to keep in mind is I'm not gonna try, I'm not gonna spend more than what I feel I can get out of it if I absolutely mm-hmm. have to. Oh, well, mm-hmm. I know, like, even back in, like, the 80s and 90s, a lot of people, the toys that were growing up, like, the G.I. Joes and, like, all that shit just in the oh. box. They're like, man, if I didn't take that out and play with it, like, I would have thousands oh. of dollars right now. I consider myself a very regretful nerd and collector because <laughs> I grew up, I was born in 73. By the time 82 came around, and you know, Star Wars was already roaring, mm-hmm. had a ton of that stuff. 
And then G.I. Joe, I remember walking around with the G.I. I had a G.I. Joe 3, a little plastic pouch that held three figures. I had my Cobra Commander, Cobra Officer, Cobra Trooper in that thing. Walking around with it on my belt, you know, wondering why the girls weren't paying attention. Still. <laughs> but I mean, the, the amount of Star Wars, G.I. Joe, mask, large size Star Wars, play sets, vehicles that have passed through mine or my brother's hands or friends' mm-hmm. hands and family's hands over the years. I wish I still had it. Mm-hmm. But I consider myself a regretful collector. Mm-hmm. I wish I still had it all. I had one. And then at the time that I could have been buying them at reasonable prices, I was out buying the new stuff. Mm-hmm. Kenner had Hasbro. Kenner had started putting out Star Wars figures again in 95. I got so excited about that. And I'm running around Long Island. Every toy show, train show, toy shop, comic shop I could mm-hmm. find to gather them all up. Completely passing up the vintage stuff that was still reasonably priced. Mm-hmm. Now, hmm. They get it. I, I can't even touch them. I kind of feel the same way about my old Pokemon card collection. Oh, man, Pokemon cards, too. My gosh. My, my cousins were old enough to be there when mm-hmm. Wizards of the Coast did the original printing of Pokemon, and mm-hmm. they had several boxes of it where they just opened it, played with it. What is something like it. that worth today? Let's say like the original first run, first year Wizards of the Coast kind of Pokemon stuff. My, my sons have f- uh, binders of this stuff given to them by a cousin. They've never played the card game in their life, mm. but they've got stacks of it. Oh, and I remember having it and fucking tying it to the back of my bicycle to make it sound like a motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, the most yeah, expensive yeah, yeah, yeah. one being a fucking holographic Charizard. Charizard. Yeah. Highest sold at auction, $220,574. These numbers. And now, is that due to... And the reason I asked the question, would you say that that number is due to rarity of print run or people holding on to them because they have them and they don't want to let them out there so that makes the desirability go up certainly both okay because i found like in the comic business <clears throat> uh in the in the in the mid to late 90s the print runs was so uh, so exaggerated it created artificial inflation it did like for example say spawn number one image comics todd mcfarlane everybody loves spawn spawn number one by the time issue 30 was coming out on the newsstands Price guides were pricing issue one at about $20. So you get every kid in town who's had his spawn number one for a year and wants a couple of bucks for the summer, you know, and he goes, hey, you want to buy this from me? And I'm going, I'll give you a dollar. I got a long box full of them. I wouldn't say, I couldn't understand how something like that was worth 20 So when the print runs and these exaggerated prices got out of hand, the bottom dropped out of paper collectibles, baseball cards, football cards, comic books. It, it, There's a reason why baseball cards, everything pre-80s is valuable. Yeah, well, rarity. It, well, correct me if I'm wrong. Baseball cards are based on actual players who have since died well, to an extent. Not only too, that, would that not make it more valuable? Some, yeah. I would some, say. yeah. Like, I assume Babe Ruth probably has a card. Like, I'd assume that would make it more valuable now. Probably. I mean, he, he's it a just famous depends. Dude. It's also, they do the cards by season as well. Mm. So you could have a baseball player, right, which are intrinsically the most valuable of the sports cards but with but, baseball it's by season so the big player who is influential in the game their best season is normally their most valuable tops card mm. i'm kind of glad in in a, in a respect that the bottom dropped out i am uh, i i was very glad because it was just you know at being a store manager for a comic book shop and ordering things on a weekly basis you see the amount of falderall that comes through Mm-hmm. And especially when people come in with it the next week and go, well, this is worth 20. You just bought it. You know, you just, it's not worth 20 because Overstreet said so, because somebody at some show in the Midwest decided to give you 20 for it. I mean, it just. It's worth what people will pay for it. Right. And if you're not willing to pay 20 bucks for it, well, then right. it's not worth 20 bucks. Well, and how many people are really going to spend? Well, like, what's a fucking Black Lotus worth? Like, how many people are actually going to buy that? Well, it it just depends, right? This is an extremely high case in an auction. Well, where correct is, me if I'm wrong. It's a banned card. You can't even fucking play with it. Seriously? <laughs> One format you can play it in. Yes. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. I thought yeah. it was because my son talks about it. He's and a, it's, he's a it's, magic it's not even a card you can fucking legally play with. Yeah, and nice. Commander. It's like bad. if you play with your friends or whatever, sure. But like if you're gonna go take it to like a, a like a proper like Magic the Gathering situation, like you, right. you can't. It's illegal. I think. I think also the longer you stay in something, yeah. the more exposed you get to it. Like if mm-hmm. if you've been with Magic the Gathering since '93 and you've got a box here and you've got a box there and mm-hmm. someone hands you a thing of that's there. 
you it's easier to get into mm -hmm. a Black Lotus or something like that than if you're going to Walmart buying a Commander deck and saying, "Ooh, I'd like to have that Black Lotus." Yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah, you're sure as fuck not going to buy. I'd like to have a Ferrari. <laughs> no, not going to happen. Yeah, but I mean, that's a pretty interesting take. Um, the idea that the bottom dropping out on, say, for example, comics. I, I kind of like that idea because it means that. For example, you talked about Spa number one, right? Mm -hmm. I remember going to a fucking antique shop in Titusville fucking forever ago. And they have a couple of booths where it's just runs of old comics. And I would always see Spawn, Fantastic Four from the 80s. I'd see some early X-Men. Nothing crazy, but it was all like 25 cents an issue. Go take your pick. Yeah. Yeah. Speculation and over print runs i think i think what happened in the 80s honestly is that people started thinking that they were going to send their kids to college by buying comic books so here's the mentality is that you're going to the comic book store now and you're buying brand new issues off the shelf and you're putting them in a bag and a board and you're putting them away in a box and you're going to put, seal them up with tape so they're hermetically perfect mm -hmm. you know how many other millions of people are doing that yeah everyone it's not, was it's, at it's, that not time. it's not they're not worth the paper they're printed on anymore except where you said earlier uh briefly 80s and, and back you know, 35 cent cover price, 25 cent cover price, 15 cent cover price, 12 cent cover price. Now you got something because there's a value out of rarity. Mm -hmm. There aren't that many of them. Whereas Spawn number one, I mean, come on, it was printed on magazine paper. I could track them all down if I wanted to because you all put them in bags and boards the next day and you kept them. You saved them because you want to, you want to get rich on comic books. Yeah, everyone to tried to speculative buy when people who were oh, doing yeah. it by accident because they actually were passionate about the hobby. Yeah. I got into it. I, I definitely got into it for that for that reason too. I mean, I, I mean, no matter what it was, uh, a, a comic book, a card set, a, a chase card, a, a, a book, whatever have you. Oh, it's going to be worth. Oh, it's worth. Uh, you mm -hmm. know. And I and I've done this and I've done the reverse speculation. I've gouged. To be perfectly honest, I remember having the shop when O.J. Simpson was driving down the freeway in the white Bronco, and I pulled every O.J. Simpson card out of the case. It was ten dollars, and I got a hundred dollars from them. Today, they're not worth the paper they're printed on. So I feel like I got rid of my garbage good. <laughs> you know, really, I feel like I got rid of my garbage good. Like, hey, everybody, just today, hundred dollars, mm -hmm. hundred dollars. Anybody, anybody, mm -hmm. can't give them away today. Nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. So I think oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. There's a way to get rid of stuff. So this is a topic that I kind of was curious about, right? So we know that intrinsically, a lot of this stuff holds value due to either rarity, what people are actually just desired to, maybe it's based off topics, so like baseball's old as fuck, so people like older baseball cards, um, misprints. Mm -hmm. So things like, um, one of the most infamous cases of this is a reverse North Carolina stamp. <laughs> right. They're like $2 million stamp set that is just six planes that are reversed rather than yeah, actually being... Like a biplanes, if I remember right. Like my yeah. brother's looking thing, yeah. Well, you got a thing in here. Yeah, it's, it's in my mono white fine. section. Fine, where the fuck it is? I always liked those... This! This here thing right here. I, I could have done that with a crayon. Like... <laughs> That that's a legit card. This is a legit card. That's a legit fucking yeah, magic the, card. The back is one hundred percent legit. It came out of a box, but that's the end of a sheet. That you're, you're not supposed to get those. Oh, okay, yeah. When they take the uncut sheet, uh -huh. right, right, right. I had one uncut sheet go. of cards yeah, back see, in the day. It's a, it's a magic card. Yeah, and that that's all it fucking said. It just it's black and it says discard printed in white. That's so that's what is, it. What does something like that sell for? I have no out of idea. Curiosity. Uh, they were a little rarer when the. Uh, this is a mistake out of Commander Legends, mm -hmm. and so now it's like forty-five bucks. Okay, I like the it mistakes. It was like two hundred bucks. I like the mistakes because they're legitimately rare. They're one in a million a lot of times. You get a, mm -hmm. a, an action figure on a blister card that's upside down. Or yeah, you, have, you know. Oh, fuck. What are these? What are these? Ugh, I know you have them. She's flipping through my magic collection. These these oh. fucking things. Well, those are intentional. <laughs> like, what those what are playtest cards. <laughs> And this is, let's see what this is. What do we got here? Do over. Restart the turn. Except this is a, a test card, not for constraints. How do you get a test card? I, I have no idea. Like, they just show why, up. what do they even put them in there for? Oh, those were for convention edition boosters for the mystery booster set for magic. That way you could draft and play with these cards that were never meant for constructed play. They lo almost look like that this do over <laughs> art is printed over yeah. it's something exactly else. What because it was. There's a, the, the, yeah, there's a, there's a border of something different mm -hmm. underneath that. Mm hmm. That's I, I genuinely like the mistakes. Uh, try, try to look for them. Try to find them. Unpunched cards are always good to find. If you could find an unpunched card like a with the little peg slot that yeah. hangs on the peg, if that's not punched, that's always good to find. 
wrong figure on the wrong card, upside down, missing weapons, that kind of stuff. Mistakes, one in a million, legitimately worth it. Yeah, one of them that I think is honestly funny is normally with a comic book, any kind of markings to the front cover or mm-hmm. anything inside the book is going to lower the PSA grading. Mm-hmm. Some kid put a red rocket sticker on a Action Comics number one Superman. Oh, no. It raised the value. Uh, h- how? It was just known as the Red Rocket the copy, Red Rocket and because copy. it got famous on the internet for it, it managed to hold higher value, and so it's the number three highest value Action Comics number one ever sold at auction. I got a weird one. <laughs> There's so, a picture of Henry Cavill holding it dressed as Superman at the auction, holding oh, it. Henry Cavill, it is it, he's just a remarkable fellow, isn't he? I got a weird one. So, Disney, whether they do it intentionally or not, they sometimes penises will just work their way into the artwork. What? So like <laughs> actually on the cover in, of the little mermaid in I the believe. little mermaid. Yeah, this is this is the one thing. of the fucking bits in the castle is it's a dick. It's yeah. straight up a dick. And like those cassettes are worth more than the agenda. yeah. Like those are legit things. I got to I got to look this up now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to look up Disney no, penis and This is something like this is actually something I heard about back mm-hmm. when Little Mermaid was still available on VHS in the clamshell case and they took that copy mm-hmm. off because people yep. were like, "Oh my god, there's a dick in the castle." Well, and like so you know the in Lion Lion King? Shit, they're not kidding. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, like look at this. Yeah. And in Didn't... Lion King, there's with the stars or something when the, the two lions are like definitely fucking <laughs> and then, then there's a the thing in the background, it's the stars, and it it looks like it says sex. It says SFX. It was supposed to be a shout out to special effects. Yeah. But they're like, oh, look, sex. Yeah. And there's just, just, for just fun stuff like that, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and Disney said, like it says, Disney says they're not pushing agenda. For years, they've been putting dicks in things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 100%. What, are these people, like, what are these people trying to tell us? There's a dick in there. That, that, that was a dick. Yeah, that is straight up a golden dildo on uh-huh. the cover of my little mermaid. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You can't unsee it. <laughs> now that it's there, and that's there that's collectible. People will pay money yeah. for that shit. I think the uh, Jesus the, Christ, there's yeah. so many. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Or like Tangled apparently has uh, on the cover sex with a uh, Tangled's hair around the guy or whatever. If I, I remember, never noticed that. Yeah, if Bondage I remember correctly, control. a buddy of mine in the mm-hmm. '80s who had. The wild technology of frame by frame VHS player, mm-hmm. fun. Damn. Put in uh, a copy of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and when Baby Herman walks underneath the woman's dress in the one scene, and she goes ah and jumps mm-hmm. up like that, if you play it frame by frame, Baby Herman puts his finger up and goes like bink, and she goes ha ah, ha ha. Like you know, if you blink, you miss it. Uh-huh. I've seen Bugs Bunny slow down to where there's one Bugs Bunny cartoon. He's coming out of the bath. He's coming out of the shower. He's doing the towel thing. And he goes. It rubs like this, and for one frame, this wang goes, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, flips out, pulls back. You're like, you know, if you're watching the regular uh-huh. cartoon, you'd miss it. Slow it down. Bugs Bunny's a bit of a pervert. Yeah. Man, I got off topic a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. You're fine. Disney dicks. Disney dicks. Yep, I told you it was a weird one. <laughs> oh, I, I guess those would be more collectible for mm-hmm. his penis. Everyone well, and that's the cells. thing is, once you once Disney's like, uh oh, and they'll go and try to remove it. That's what makes people want it more because they can't get them anymore. Exactly. Yeah, they'll exactly. run to the store and grab the VHSs before they're pulled off the mm-hmm. shelf for product recall. Do you have the Little Mermaid with the penis? <laughs> uh, yeah, aisle twelve. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Disney, and they're not pushing an agenda. God forbid. When they're not pushing an agenda, they're pushing penis. Uh, well, you know, one way or another, we'll push something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Disney's another one of those things, just big amounts of collectibles, collectibilities for years. I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, Disney stuff was, I'm mean, one of the first toys I had when I, when I was a kid was the seven dwarf pack, mm-hmm. squeezable little seven dwarfs. I remember that being on my, my windowsill in the seventies. They've always been mass marketing their stuff. Oh, I know a lot of able. people collect like the, the Mickey Mouses and stuff too over the years. Like they, I think they have a new Ooh, one every year. Kind I, of I got a too. story about that. Okay. <laughs> so, he, my dad had inherited from his grandmother a Fantasia Mickey, like, 20-inch glass statue oh, okay. of Mickey. Yeah. And I was packing up for Christmas, you know, putting everything in the boxes, and I'm taking this tote, and you I'm break putting it. it up on the top rack, I and feel like you broke it. the box falls out of my hands, yeah. hits me in the face, I come down, fall onto the floor, get knocked out. Uh, Mickey. Snapped at the neck. Aye. My dad 
is curious, and he goes down to the, uh, like, Disney store, and or formerly Disney Springs, where they have all that, like, high-dollar Disney store yeah. merch. That thing was apparently worth, like, 11 grand. Seriously. My Uncle Phil... Because it, it was real old. Like, that was original yeah. run Mickey. My Uncle Phil used to collect Mickey Mouse stuff in the 80s. He had the, the, uh, the very iconic, like, the Mickey Mouse telephone. Mm-hmm. He had the Mickey Mouse... Wall size swatch watch the Mickey Mouse watch. He had all of the first run, very first run VHS tapes that all had the gold covers and the clamshell, mm-hmm. the clamshell case with the gold covers that was like Mickey, Minnie, Donald, mm-hmm. Goofy, Pluto. Mm-hmm. Two of all of them because you know at the time VHS tapes were about $90. Mm-hmm. But he bought two of them of each so he could play one for us and the grandkids and then he could you know put one away and he had, he had tons of this stuff. He had a little crystal, Swarovski crystal. Mickey Mouse's, Minnie Mouse's, Pluto's. I mean, oh, the amount of money. I know my mom used to collect the uh, little cherished teddy bears. I or the know. weird those... fucks who collect Beanie Babies. <clears throat> oh, oh, come on. Oh, there was, man. There was a, I don't know if it was like a Dr. Phil or something. There was one of the like court divorce situations. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're having to split up the fucking Beanie Babies Come on, Beanie in court. Babies. Beanie Babies. Beanie I mean, I they're can't. worth... So much money on some of them, though. It's ridiculous. Are they like, still, though? I, mean, some... I, 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 I can remember that one, uh, 97, there was one for Princess Diana. It was a white bear with a little, little white rose mm-hmm. on it. And that thing was like, you're paying how much? Mm-hmm. People are paying a couple hundred dollars for the little stuffed bear. And it's not even <laughs> stuffed all the way through. And yeah. I'm going like, are, are we thinking here? Mm-hmm. Like, what is this? You know, I almost look the same way at Funko Pop sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, like Funko Pops, like, oh, here's this thing that everyone's buying and just kind of dusting and it's going to go nowhere. Where are Beanie Babies? I have so many Funko Pops because people just assume I collect Funko Pops. I never once even really cared for them, but they're like, oh, here you go. Here you go. You have so many Funko Pops. Here you go. I was like, oh, yay, yeah. thanks. You like that thing? I found a Funko of it for you. Oh, you're, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, we're going to go back to Beanie Babies for a second. Oh, you're going to shit bricks at this. Oh, yeah, I you told go. you. Probably. There is a set called Large Wallace and His Squad. And then that's okay. the name of a Beanie Baby set? Yes. Okay. Large Wallace and His Squad. Is it like sure a this walrus is an and like a It's a set seal? of five bears. Okay. And they're all bears. Three are green. One's incredibly large. And then there's a white bear and a brown bear. Okay. 600 grand. Oh. I'm n- six. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. Or the Princess the Bear, the one you were talking about. <laughs> right. Yeah. Princess. 500 grand. Oh, my God. 100 grand. But how many people have actually let's th- <clears throat> let's think about this. Let's I'm going to ask the question. Mm-hmm. They say it's worth five hundred thousand. Has anybody actually buy paid five hundred thousand dollars? And that's the same thing I have with like the Black Lotus. Like who who the fuck now, has that money? Like, I mean, unless con- you're like interestingly you know, enough, there are, there are, interestingly enough, there are people who pay this kind of money uh-huh. though because I, I did an interview with uh, uh, my company last weekend, and the gentleman I spoke with. Told me he sold a few boxes of unopened boosters from '93 for like 190 grand. Oh, so there are God. people who will do it. Oh yeah, or bubbles or the fish beanie baby, 129 thousand dollars. Good God, I, just a little angel fish. I dressed up my dog. Just her, an angel fish. Her very first Halloween costume. I just made the little beanie baby the the ty mm-hmm. tag, and I put that on her collar. That's fun. That's it was good. adorable. I only had. She's one. not gonna sell for that much money. I did but. have one. I did have one beanie baby. It was called a Bambino. And he had pinstripes on him and Derek Jeter's number with the Yankees thing on him. And I was like, oh, all right, I put him on my windowsill. I had, I think I had like a, a cat. Right. And maybe like a bear. Of what, just Beanie Babies? Yeah. My, my mom was nuts with giving me Beanie Babies. I had like a tiger. I had like a little mammoth. I had a bunch of shit. I can look. I think those are the little stuffed animals that they still sell at the 7-Eleven right up the street from me. I think that that Possibly. little kiosk there... Now that you mentioned the TY tag, mm-hmm. you're going to go back and look. I keep passing by. Actually, I bought a Darth Vader figure from that little I know. I still mm-hmm. see them in, like, Barnes & Nobles and stuff. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Like, in a little kid section, I'll be walking by to look at, like, all the D&D books. And it's, like, two aisles across, and I'll see the Beanie Babies. I wonder if there's a community for Beanie Babies well, and, sure. and, like, there, and, there's and, a community and pedophiles. For yeah. And pedophiles. And pedophiles. <laughs> and, and, and probably, like, scattered if, in with the bronies. If it exists, there's porn of it. Like, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. There, unfortunately, there is. I, I really came apart when I heard of Dino porn. And I was listening to this on the radio and like a fool Googled it and so some things you can't unsee. So I mistakenly joined a, a group on Facebook. Oh no, you did not do that. I on I have to look it up, but it's it's like dinosaurs gone wild or some shit. It, oh no. <laughs> to be fair, it was to be fair. It was my own mistake. 
Dinosaur has gone wild is what it's called. Th- this is the fucking cover photo. It's fucking hilarious. Like, <laughs> Come on, man. I was cool. like, what have I what have I gotten myself into? Yeah, you know, like sometimes you hear things and you just gotta see for yourself. And I made that mistake like, the first time some, I heard that expression, dino porn. I went, no. Some of it's funny, but then it's just I was like, what? What happened? Come on, man. This was innocent. This is not what I was yeah, expecting this is, this when was a nice I did this. Thing about dinosaurs a moment ago, and now it's and, and now, now they've got now titties. this is happening. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about stuff. But how can you get into that? I mean, like what's what's what's? Well, it's ooh. the the concept of like you've a never furry. felt the touch of a woman. That's what it is. I, I, well, I certainly haven't felt the touch of a velociraptor. Well, <laughs> Maybe there's something to it. You're oh, missing you know out. What? Now you're getting curious. <laughs> I know. You're, you're falling <laughs> down the rabbit hole. Man. There is there is a velociraptor statue down in Sanford. I might cozy up to after a few bourbons. Well, like I said, there's there's what, furries, and then I think they're called scalies or something like it's. You, That's you the know, first time I've ever heard that expression. Do you know what a furry is? Yes. Yeah, so it's that, but instead of, you know, fuzzy animals, it's like reptiles and shit. Uh, yeah, I, I could be wrong on the expression, it's but yeah. Tight. yeah. Yeah, so that's, I that's I where I, I would know. assume the, the, the dinosaurs would Not to sound like them. an old fuddy-duddy, but what the hell ever happened to guy on top, get it over with quick shit? <laughs> you know, like, you know, come on, furries, scalies, fuzzies, dizzies, wackies, what the Disney, fuck? Yeah. Disney, yeah. <laughs> Disney... My God! But you know, like you said, if you could think of it, there's yeah, something there's of it. I, mean, of it. I, I, it I don't exists. know. It's the same reason why I've got like that fucking poster of Wonder Woman, man. <clears throat> this is why the aliens won't land here. <laughs> yeah, because they're afraid. Like if we land here, like hang we're on, we're gonna get fucked. That's we've been is. monitoring the transmissions. <laughs> now they're either gonna they're either gonna put us in prison, dissect us, or fuck us. Likely, fuck us. <laughs> and we ain't ready for this. It's probably all three. Yeah, look what they do to each other. The that guy's dressed as a horse. The- <laughs> that guy's dressed as a horse, and the woman behind him's got a whip. Weird. We're not doing this. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead. And get yeah, back to <laughs> well, since since you went to the Wonder Woman, how can we, let's talk about artwork. Oh sure. All right, I actually prepared a little piece for this. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in two thousand five purchased a movie poster in auction for six hundred and ninety thousand dollars for the movie Metropolis. Was he in that movie? No. It wasn't even in the movie. It's like a twenties German movie. Oh, okay. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a classic film. It's got some some of the beginnings of the special effects and mm-hmm. sci fi and all that. And it's a it's a the um, old mummy movie where it was like in the prime of monster movies, mm-hmm. like after Frankenstein, Nosferatu. That was like the second highest, but it was signed by the director. Before autographs really became before that for that for that month, that's what he paid that much money for for autographed also. Well, it wasn't autographed for the Metropolis poster. Oh, okay, okay. I'm just saying the one that was the second highest was the Mummy. Oh, okay. Not like Understood. the fucking Brendan Fraser one, but like the 20s Mummy. Yeah. But still fucking ridiculous. Imagine adjusting that for inflation today. Like, uh, like, like, like that's over a mil. I, I, I would say so. It'd have to be. But also, again, due to rarity, that film came out in 1927. How many of those original posters from that movie survived? Probably only that one. Mm-hmm. Maybe only that one. Especially 1927. Think about uh, during the late 30s and the early 40s in this country. Paper drives, cop- copper drives to support war efforts. Baseball cards, comic books, pennies, all these Fuck, things. Nothing survived so, the Second World War in yeah. Germany. In Germany. Nothing, hardly anything survived the Second World War in Germany mm-hmm. for fuck's sake. You know, maybe what, 30, 35 people? You know, bad scene, bad scene, man, you know, uh, but something like that I could see for rarity, especially being iconic, you know, one of the first sci-fi films, mm-hmm. and that's an original poster. I get that. Yeah. I get that. I get that. And that's not for collectors like us. That's for people like Leo who've got some money. To- yeah, that's for famous people who have millions and millions of dollars as opposed to yeah. me who's got 25 bucks. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't want to buy a oh, magic sure. card that's above 20. I don't, can't buy a figure above 40, you know. Like 600 grand for a poster? Buy two this small. Well, and I'm sure that Leonardo DiCaprio actually happens to enjoy that movie. It's not just for intrinsic value. I'm sure. I would, I would think he so. He probably holds a personal attachment to that movie. I would think so. He's in the industry. Yeah. You know, it's got to be... Mm-hmm. Probably both. You're spending that much money. You know it's sort of an investment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you must also have a deep appreciation. Mm-hmm. I think that being said, I think a lot of the things, some of the things that I have bought over the over the years, especially recently, and I guess a lot over the years, really aren't intrinsically value, uh, valuable to anybody but me. Yeah, the things that you deeply desire. Yeah. I, I buy Darth Vader figures. Uh, wherever I can find them, I buy them at 7-Eleven. You know, if they've got this stupid little Darth Vader, doesn't do anything, you know, just maybe raises his hand, I'll, I'll buy that and put that on the stack, you know. 
Yeah. You know, I buy silly things like that. I'm in a dollar store and I see like a thing. Like, I'll buy it. Yeah, it's like the people who collected Godzilla statues. Yeah, right? exactly. There's fucking six million different Godzilla statues. Oh my statues. god. Oh yeah, yeah. But oh, you go oh, to yeah. a con and a guy's got a table fucking full of them. Got your OG. And they can OG, be 20 bucks 20, to yeah. 6,000 dollars a statue. Hmm? Oh. The sky's always the limit, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just got to find where your value is, where you're at. Uh, I find with a lot of these things that we like, comics, movies, toys, sci-fi, Magic the Gathering, whatever yeah. have you. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and bring it right to this little thing. Yeah. Okay. So, that was a Hobby Lobby, right? Uh -huh. well, it's, it, it, we are in audio form, if you could tell. I, I was going to get to that, <laughs> rather you would believe it or not. It is a cookie jar that is shaped like the one-up mushroom from Mario, right? So red top mushroom. Originally listed at $50. I said, fuck no, I'm not paying $50 for a cookie jar. Oh, it's on clearance for 50% off? Shit, I'll buy a cookie jar for $25. <laughs> that go. hit my limit. There you go. Isn't it amazing how something that is completely worthless to you, suddenly it's on clearance, it's like, oh, I'll take one. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Oh, if it was a green one and a little smaller, I would have bought it too. I, uh, Professor John Tenuto, uh, I forget where he teaches, but he appeared on the Netflix show "The Toys That Made Us." And what I was saying uh, before you mentioned the mushroom, a lot of the things that we like, we can't go out and really go do. Like if you're a sports fan, we talked about baseball cards. If you're a sports fan, you can go to the game. You can go to the game. You can go see the player. You can go out and reach and touch and have that experience. You know. But if you're into magic or fantasy or Dungeons oh, yeah. and Dragons Fantasies. and Star mm -hmm. Wars action, well, whatever, we don't have that ability as a group in yeah. nerd culture I, I in can't. general to go out and do that thing. Yeah, I can't, can't go, go ride pet Panthor. A dragon. No, can't ride Panthor. Wish I could. Can't pet a dragon. Yeah. Well, you can go LARPing, but you still can't pet a dragon. I can, I can pet a fake dragon, but that's yeah, not the same. Pet that's good enough. I can go get a chicken. That's the closest we got, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. I mean, uh, the basilisk. Yes, the basilisk. <laughs> so, like these things become then intrinsically valuable to show that affinity, that affiliation. That we're reaching. That we're re exactly. I can go and watch a Star Wars movie <clears throat> being filmed, but really, what am I seeing? I'm seeing Harrison Ford sitting in the seat waiting for his call. Mm -hmm. You know, half the Falcon there. It's not the whole thing. You know, it's hot out. Mm -hmm. The craft table is over there. This isn't what I, you know. Yeah, the glue's is, melting everywhere. The glue is totally melting. Like, you know, once Harrison is doing his thing for 17 seconds, you're like, yeah, yeah, and it's over. And you're like, I I've done cosplay before. I know how quickly everything falls apart. Exactly. I'm looking into a hand solo cosplay for yeah. myself for October. Yeah, yeah they're good. I figure they're I could fun. pull off Scoundrel. So, hmm. There we go. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, do we have any other notes we want to bring up or anything else we would like to talk about for this um, topic? Do you want to talk about, like, like game consoles or Warhammer? The other only two I got. Oh, fucking Warhammer. <laughs> my God. I do not have a reference for Warhammer. Game consoles I have a personal history with, as well as an expanded history. I, I, I am so old, I had a Coleco combat machine. And, and, and if you've ever seen one, for those listening at home, it was a, a big green box, an olive drab, that had two joysticks on the right, two joysticks on the left with a fire button, three black and white mazes, and you steered the tanks at each other. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. And then into Atari 2600 yeah, like and television, Coleco, ColecoVision. And then I kind of dropped off the face of the earth until, like, you know, Super Nintendo, uh, not Super Nintendo, regular Nintendo, excuse me, the original NES. I had mm -hmm. one of those in high school. Today at my house, because my, my, my children are incredibly spoiled, we have... A few switches, and we have a PlayStation 2, 3, 4, we have Xbox, Xbox 360, mm -hmm. Xbox. I mean, we have a whole back room of the house that's full of consoles. And I, I love going back and playing the original Genesis. I love going, we have one of those. I love going back and playing that, and then N64. My, oh, I uh, love the N64. Oh, yeah. They... My coworker collects video game consoles, so, like, mm -hmm. he'll constantly go out and, you know, see a old refurbished GameCube or N64 or whatever, and he's like, yep. <laughs> I would love to have an old, uh, I, I imagine, refurbished. I, I would Something known, yeah. that's like, you know, technologically sound reasonably mm -hmm. today. I'd love to have an old Atari. Just because that reaches to me, mm -hmm. to where I, you know, uh, you know, we used to just chase the dot. Mm -hmm. Now I look at the video games that are out there now, it's things my kids play, the things I try to play with them. They look like movies. That Assassin's Creed makes me dizzy. When he's all the way up on the top of a bell tower in a cathedral and he's looking down over the town and he does this swirl and I'm going, I'm getting dizzy because like, whoa, 
that's high up. I'm like, what happened to Pac-Man? Yeah, what happened to Pac-Man? You know, like, dun, 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 dun. I, I love, I, oh, man, I want, I would love to have a Miss Pac-Man table. Mm-hmm. Like they had in the pizza place when I was a kid, the tabletop, you know. My Friday night was four quarters on one side, a pack of Marlboro's on the other. and just Have you been to uh, Arcade Monsters? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I really enjoy that place. I, I, I love the nostalgia of it all, and that's what keeps me going with all of this. Mm-hmm. You know, the recent purchase of the Superman, uh, the, the Super, uh, Superpowers Batman and Robin set, the Batmobile, the Star Wars stuff, Power Rangers. Uh, we just brought a couple of new Gundam robots home yesterday. Uh, you know. Oh, you just reignited a spark in me. Fucking Power <laughs> Rangers. I, oh. re- I, re- I was big into Power Rangers when I was a child when, you know, like Dino Thunder, yep. Mystic Force, all of yep. the, like, Mid two thousand series. That was on. Uh, that was uh, for me. That was when I was into the speculative part of my collecting in the nineties. And I had flipped through the stations on one of the stations here locally and saw Power Rangers for the first time and thought I was looking at a live action Voltron. Mm-hmm. You know, pink, yellow, blue, black. It seemed to make sense to me. And I was like, "This isn't Voltron. This is like kind of like Godzilla. It's a guy in a rubber suit stomping on a model of the town." Okay, well, whatever. But then they started talking about these toys that you couldn't get your hands on. So that speculative side of me starts running around looking for Power Rangers all over the place. And I wound up with a few sets of the barrel-chested Automorphin Power Rangers. Again, regretful collector. Wish I still had these things. Don't know where they went to. Uh, today, <clears throat> I have an unbroken collection of the, uh, the Hasbro Lightning Collection Power Rangers. Unbroken. Every figure, every role play piece, every helmet, morpher, you name it. It's all there. It t- contains... Right now, three bookcases and almost a wall of a room, uh, and it's still expanding. We just got Wave Eleven the other day. See, I wanted, I wanted, I want to have that with board games. I want my collection to be much bigger. I, I, I love this. I, I love want what it you more. Have. You're, you're I collecting want quality more. games, though. I love what you got. I mean, yeah. You're just not collecting every fucking board game that exists. You're grabbing all the good ones. Well, do you have, yeah, but do you have Super Fight? I don't know, oh, but Super there's a lot Fight. of really good games out there, and I, I, I would, I want to build my collection. Like, when we go to Dice Tower and you see all the games, that's, that's what I want. Yeah, and it's a fucking whole panel wall full oh, of board games. no, 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 honey. It's it's a room. Oh. <laughs> Why not? I, I think these things are not only intrinsically valuable to you. But they're fun. But they are fun. You can, you can, I like things you can get use out of, too. Like, yes. collecting something that you can purpose ah. and function, I think, is ah. fun. Everything I buy comes out of the box. Yeah? I Everything. When you look at the Power Ranger wall, like I says previous, it's not a wall full of beautiful boxes mm-hmm. all in a row of... A, no, 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 man. I take everything out of the box and divide it all up by color. Here's the blues, the greens, the reds, the whites, mm-hmm. the silvers. Here's, you know, <laughs> you know and, and they're all posed. Here's the in-space guys up against the in-space cog and about the thing and then Lord Zed with the... They come out of the box. If I'm paying anything for mm-hmm. it, Twenty dollars, forty dollars, ten dollars. I want to know what I got. I'm taking it mm-hmm. out of the box. I'm going to play with it. I want to see. I want to hold the gun and, and make him stand up and pose and do. Everything is out of the box. I do save the boxes, especially if it's resealable. Mm-hmm. Uh, blister cards, eh, not so much, but you know, like resealable Black Series boxes, Lightning Collection, Power Rangers, things like that. Anything you could reseal, mm-hmm. I'll take it out of the box, and I have a whole closet in the house just overflowing with boxes. Overflow. I have to find more of them. Storage units. There we go. Fun fact. Yeah. Uh, I went to high school with one of the guys who played. It was either the blue or the green Power Ranger. He, the blue one, David Yost. It, it was. I don't. It was you, one of the more recent ones. Specific. I don't know. I just know I went to school with a Power Ranger. There you go. That's, That's cool. Enough. <laughs> it's still impressive. I I don't couldn't have tell that you kind which of... one. Couldn't tell you which actor. I just know I did it. I don't have that kind of coolness. I, I I did go to the same high school in New York as a very famous actor. Very famous actor. Unfortunately, he's not. Uh, he's famous for not making the best movies, mm-hmm. and he's come uh, uh, you know publicly known as the Hedgehog, old Ron Jeremy. Ah, oh. he went to Cardoza High School the same as I did. He became... <laughs> You know, he was a neighborhood kid, you know, so that's our claim to fame at Cardoza. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, you know, hey, Ron Jeremy came from here. I went to school with a comedian. Which comedian? Daniel Tosh. Oh. Oh, that's right. Oh. I forget you tell fucking me, dick. fucking Tosh. I, I imagine he would be. Yeah. Is he that smarmy in real life? Because I oh, don't yeah. think I, that's an I, act. I, that's no, how he is I, all the time. That's yeah. definitely got to be him. Yeah. I think somebody one day listened to him and went, we can do something with this. <laughs> you know, you have whatever it is. I, I just can't believe that show's still on the fucking air. I didn't know it was. I didn't know it was. Mm-hmm. A lot of times when I see things, I think it's in rerun. Uh, in the break room at work, one day somebody had the television on and Jerry Springer was on. 
Yeah, and Jerry Springer's still fucking going. Still I thought it was a rerun from 97. Yeah. Like, seriously? He was still doing this? Well, they're still doing fucking Price is Right. Like, Drew uh, Carey's... Price like, is Right is a classic, and I, I don't know. think so. I'm just saying, like, I remember <sighs> when Drew Carey did Whose Line Is It Anyway, and he was real fat. <laughs> I I, I, I miss whose line is it? Uh, I remember whose well, line they, is it they anyway with Clive it. Anderson. They redid it, and this uh, Aisha Tyler. It's not the same. Oh no! It's not the same. Like this Aisha's is... fine, but like man, Drew, Drew Carey's Carey. just perfect. Like I miss the Drew Carey show. I did. I, like I that looked show. for that on DVD. They haven't made a fucking box set for it yet. I'm uh, I did have the first season. This is a store I miss. Was Movie Stop. Mm-hmm. GameStop company. I love. Are you going in and get a DVD? I bought the Drew Carey show for a season. I think I paid four ninety nine. Oh, I remember you know? back in Disney Springs before they had that bowling alley there. There mm-hmm. used to be like three story movie shop where the first floor was all CDs. Oh, and wasn't that? Uh, I think that used to be the Virgin store when it first opened. Mm-hmm. It's like a corner kind of. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the, the second and third floor were. All movies. Yeah. And that was the only way I could get Godzilla movies when I was real young until Best Buy started stocking them after 98. Yeah. It's always been uh, one thing I love about nerd culture. And I'll go back to your very first episode. Uh, you know, I, I have listened. I don't know that I, I don't think I necessarily agree that nerd culture is dead per se, but I think it changed. Oh, yeah. It evolved. It became chic. It, it became it's, chic. It's not it's, what it it's, used to be. It's now it's cool not. to be a nerd. <laughs> oh, my God. This is the kind of stuff you used to get your ass kicked mm-hmm. for. And if, know, look at fucking Henry Cavill. Right, but if you were walking around the street in Queens at 10 years old and you had a fucking three-pack of G.I. Joe's uh-huh. on your belt, there was a good chance you were going to take some shit. Yeah. Good chance. Now, people are like, oh, what Joe's do you have? Mm-hmm. Oh, I had the... Oh, do you remember the... Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, it's all very chic well, and very Well, even cool. a place like fucking Lowe's. Uh-huh. Like sure. Half the fucking employees all playing magic, or they're all fucking yeah. talking about the next game that's coming out. Yeah. Are you going to watch Obi Wan Kenobi? Did you see the Book of Boba Fett? Did you get that magic deck? Did you mm-hmm. get that Pokemon card? Did you see this video? Of- yeah. Like it's the only ones who aren't doing it are the fucking old farts who are about to retire. Hey, okay, now I'm I, I'm 49 years of age. I haven't stopped yet. Guys, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. I was doing interviews, and I. One of the questions I had asked in the interview was, what do you think your greatest strength was? And this motherfucker answered, charisma. And I was like, he plays Dungeons and Dragons. Plus five. <laughs> We're going to get along. Yeah. You got a plus four to charisma, my guy, really? That's 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 pretty funny. That's I, pretty funny. I hired him. Roll for persuasion. <laughs> you know what? I think that's what got me hired in the position I'm going to be taking up. I 100% somebody. hired him. And as soon as I said, well, you know, he, he I, I have an interest in these things outside. And he was like, well, I have the Millennium Falcon full-size cockpit in my garage in my house well, in Colorado. I, I use it as a movie room. I'm going. I remember because I was in your interview when yeah. we were hired for MST. Yes. and. I remember we talked about nerd shit for a while. <laughs> I, I remember that interview very, very clearly because you and Nick looked right at me and went, oh, he's going to get along just fine. <laughs> just wait till he meets Paul. He'll be yep. great. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, so, but still, it, it's, uh, you know. I, I want to talk a little bit here about things that are in the nerd space that aren't necessarily collectible, okay. but still carry a pretty hefty price tag. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and list an example here. So, when you go to Megacon this or this next weekend, mm-hmm. dice sets. Oh, that, my. Yes. Like, you so, can buy dice sets for hundreds of dollars where they're yes. made out of they're fucking the nice platinum. Metal they're metal dice. Hollow. They're yes. all, like, hand-painted. Like, yeah. Oh. Or, like, just all of the fucking art that... It, it's not even a known artist, but... That dude made a fucking map of, like, Hyrule out of a fucking cloth and sewn it together. Mm-hmm. It looks like an actual piece you would have held in history. Well, and I know, like, uh, Critical Role, for instance, like, they have plenty of their own dice that they've made. Like, one of the girls has bone dice. I'm pretty sure she made those, like... Mm. Fucking carved them out of a skull. I, I, yeah. yeah, really, you know, they, they go, they're going grave robbing. Like, this will make a nice <laughs> I, I, I remember the original, uh, my original TSR uh, Dungeons and Dragons set from 84, 85. The dice that came in it um, didn't have any numbers. It had a white crayon and you had to push the wax into the numbers. <laughs> you had to rub, the, yeah, like the 20 side, the 6 side, you know, and you're sitting here like, what the fuck is the crayon for? And, like, and it tells you, <laughs> rub it into the numbers. You know? And you're like, oh, okay. And I'm wiping them down. I got these little red dice with the white numbers. I'm so slick. You know, ooh, look at that. Oh my God. But I, I think that like dice, things like that. I, I like to call those the strike while the iron's hot 
side of our culture, our thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's always that unofficial stuff. There's always going to be the people that like the official. I want the D&D set. I want the official Star Wars. I want the official. But then there's so much room out there well, today for people to make metal dice, bone <clears throat> dice. Or e- and- even things like proxy magic cards. You want that yes. black lotus? Fine. There's some fucker on Etsy who makes it. Pay I, that, that's, I, I, that, that black lotus he was sent, uh, talking about earlier at $511,000. My son was telling me, this guy, yeah, you can print one. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll I'm go going really. Then what's the point? I'll, I'll snip that fucker out. Yeah, but what's the point? Like, if you could put that in your deck by snip, mm-hmm. he's like, yeah, but you can't use it. It's like, well, okay, no, but I, I fucking can. I understand an official. T- I understand like an official <laughs> term- tournament. You probably don't want to pull out a reprint or a self print of a black lotus. But if you're playing with your buddies, yeah, you know, yeah, and you're in I, their kitchen all of a sudden, my five hundred eleven thousand dollars. Yeah, you know, on the whammo, counter. deal with mm-hmm. it. You know, but I think that you know, the, the, I just bought a lightsaber the other night from one of these companies. Oh, and they're fucking worthless afterwards, but uh, they're fun as fuck. Yeah, they are. You know, like I, you see, I took a look at, it and I did my, I did some research. You know, and I found that the official stuff really wasn't up my alley. I, I bought the Luke Skywalker one from Return of the Jedi, and it has that narrow end to it. That uh, the emitter, it, it look, I think it's an old gas stove piece, if I remember correctly, from the actual prop. And anytime you go out and buy one, like the Star Wars Black series or the the Disney Legacy ones, they can never do the blade. Mm-hmm. Of the lightsaber without sacrificing the look, the the neck, the, the emitter is always nice and wide because the the blade is big. Yeah, and but otherwise to un- it's gonna. Yeah, you have to unscrew the one and put the one back on, put the other piece back on, then put the blade back in. I bought one that I felt was aesthetically pleasing to me. That doesn't do that. Like I don't have to unscrew it and put in a bigger piece, and the blade comes out, and mm-hmm. it's got a, it's got an SD card and USB charger. It's got sixteen sound fonts. And My a dad's pixel got a, and... a Darth Maul lightsaber. It lights up and it makes the sounds and everything. Yeah, I got one of those. It's mm-hmm. uh, the Disney Legacy one. It's about eight feet long. By the time you get the blades in it, mm-hmm. yeah, visually and dynamic and so cool. Yeah, it's just it's enjoy. sitting up above the, cool the living that. room. Cool as that. Um, yeah, but I bought that. I bought that from a third party. Mm-hmm. That's not an official thing. That's one of those groups out there that strikes while the iron's mm-hmm. hot. That has the the know how. And I, I do think to 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 uh, borrow a phrase from a very popular YouTube channel I like called Retro Blasting. Uh, the fans are doing the best work mm-hmm. with whatever it is. They take that passion. They take that interest. They take the little minor details. Mm-hmm. And they really put it forth in their product. My my son my sons have bought dice that I, I'm like you you pay how much for dice? He's oh only ninety bucks. But they're gorgeous. Yeah, like and they're I gorgeous. Know, it's art. So dice, for instance, like MegaCon will make a new dice every year, like a new mm-hmm. set of dice, and they'll have the MegaCon die. Like that alone is a collectible because you sure. get one at every con. Like I know a lot of people who go and do that specifically. Well, I tell you what, what's real weird is some of these uh, Comic Con exclusive items, right? Um, one of the top Lego sets, right, was a 30 brick set. Several thousand dollars, right? Okay. For a piece of pizza from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a Lego piece. That sounds cool, but not for that much money. 2013 pizza? New York Comic Con exclusive. Uh, I tell you, I found recently that some of the Lego sets I had when I was young, a long time ago, when Lego was not merchant, was Le- when Lego was not um, what's the what's the word? Um, That's popular. No, 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 no. Um, merchandised. Uh, um, anyway, <laughs> nineteen ninety nine is when that started with Lego with the Star Wars Episode One kits and the Star Wars kits licensed. There we when go. When they started making mm-hmm. licensed kits, excuse me. Before that, Lego was just a very in- reasonably inexpensive building tool. Mm-hmm. But I had these ones that were like Lego space. And it had to be 80, very early 80s, 80, 81. I had a big plastic case, like a trunk that said Lego on it. And you could just randomly dump all your bricks in it and whatever. They were all the same anyway. But there was these pieces from Lego Space that were like, they were bases. They were the platforms. And they had raised craters on them and then places to start building. And, mm-hmm. you know, and you could build a rocket with the, do all the, I found that those are worth like, whoa, they're worth a ton of money. Ton of money now. And it was just an inexpensive building tool. It was a thing like, you know, the Lego and the Erector set from Gabriel, the Gabriel toy company. They had the Erector set. Lego had that stuff, building bricks, toys to just Mm -hmm. imagination. Yeah. Now it's like, here you go. You can build the Jedi Starfighter. Yeah. My dad used to just go on eBay and get like random miscellaneous Lego pieces and go, here you go. Yeah. I mean, it worked. (laughs) 
It does. I had a Harry Potter Lego set oh. for quite a while. That was that was well, fun. I enjoyed the that. The Hogwarts one was yeah. pretty expensive for a while, yeah. I have both pieces of that. The original, the first Hogwarts cast. I think there's another version of it now, but back uh, a couple of years back, maybe 10, 12 years back, whatever it was at this point. And I, I admit I did it because, uh, you know, I was trying to one-up my ex-wife at the time <laughs> when we were going through the thing. And I'm like, here you go, kid. Well, you got to have the other one. You know, so they got the two parts of the big Hogwarts castle. We still have it in bags with the original instructions. And I'm like, do not let these things go. The Knight's Bus, Hagrid's Castle. We have a bunch of the um, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull kits. We have a bunch of the Lego City kits. We have a train that goes around mm-hmm. and around. You know, we have big uh, plastic containers out in the garage full of the Lego. Never mind the Star Wars kits that are on display. I mean, our house is just, it, it, it's never ending. It's a museum. It is. It really is, from the front door to the back door. I mean, the kitchen displays Transformers and Masters of the Universe. Mm-hmm. My office displays Legos and lightsabers and Star Wars stuff. There's Power Rangers and Gundam robots, video game consoles. I don't know. You find it, Star Trek stuff. I mean, you can find it all. Role-play weapons. I've got Klingon swords yeah, and my power staffs. And... i got chicken statues everywhere. <laughs> I, yeah, I noticed that. That's a... Chicken statues, Magic the Gathering, and board games. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's whatever tickles the fancy, mm-hmm. you know. There's a lot of crossover. Like, I look here at your Deadpool. I look there, you know, well, Wonder Woman is not bad there, you know. <laughs> no, that's not a bad I, I, I like Wonder Woman. You know, like Pin up Wonder Woman and Catwoman and Supergirl. I, I remember when the X-Men did a swimsuit issue in the 90s, you know, and Psylocke is coming out of the water with this tiny, like, oh. mm. And I'm going, like, what does this have to do with superheroism? I don't know. It doesn't even matter. I don't even care, but this is going on my wall. Like, you know? <laughs> but boobies make money. Boobies, it reaches yes, me. Sex, it reaches me at a level. Sex sells. It, it certainly does. It should not, but it does. Well, I think on the note of sex, we're going to go ahead and end this one. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wise. Uh, Jen, could you go ahead and do our plugs? So, insert plug here. Uh, you can find both Zach and myself on Instagram, Spotify, Apple, Twitch, YouTube. Uh, working on a website now, actually. And uh, we got a merch store as well. So check us out in all of those things. Awesome. Uh, Bill, you want to go ahead and do yours? Well, thank you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I have an older name. It's uh, Beltmark underscore Bill. Uh, you can find a lot of uh, my sci-fi collectibles, Star Wars things, Hasbro stuff, as well as a wealth of professional wrestling ephemera that I used to do. And you can find that stuff on YouTube as well. If you go to youtube.com slash beltmarkbill or just search me, Bill Gritz, G-R-I-T-Z. And it's about 80, 90 videos of that stuff there with some new content being created uh, currently. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the time to, to have a conversation with you. All right. Well, thank you very much for the listen, guys. Um, have a good time collecting. Just don't spend too much money or you'll go broke. Have a good one, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.